Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky, sponsored by Squarespace. And it is March, which means we have an equinox this month. So all over the world, day and night will be of roughly equal length. But for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, the nights continue to shorten day by day. So you want to make the most of the dark skies whilst you still can. Coming up this month, we have the return of the Milky Way core. It's also a good time of year to see and photograph the zodiacal light. And that also means it's a good time of year to see and photograph something rare called the Gegenschein. Venus reaches greatest western elongation, and it also has a nice conjunction with Saturn towards the end of the month. But before we deep dive into all of that and more, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is the place to host your website or online store. It has so many uses. I use my Squarespace website to host my galleries where I can show off my images. There's also a blog page where I can write articles and useful tutorials. And I very recently uploaded a gear page where I show all of the gear that I use to take my images and record these videos. If you'd like to give Squarespace a go, head on over to squarespace.com forward slash Alan and start your free trial using one of their award-winning templates. You can customize it to your heart's content, set up an online shop to sell your products, and then if you're happy with your website and you want it to go live, use the code Alan at the checkout for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name with Squarespace. Starting in the Northern Hemisphere where Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, starts the night high in the Northeast and climbs higher and higher until it reaches directly overhead at the zenith. And then if we look towards the Northwest, you'll see Cassiopeia, w shape made of bright stars. There's a faint section of the Milky Way that runs from the North to the northwest and then of course you have m31 andromeda the spiral galaxy just to the west of cassiopeia and that will show up even in your wide angle images facing southwest in the evening and you'll notice all of the bright winter constellations are now starting the night high in the south but they all sink down towards the western horizon and they will begin to set around local midnight so really want to make the most of orion and co this month because we don't have much time left with this beautiful region of the night sky facing east in the evening skies you notice leo now rising a lot earlier leo is recognizable from the backwards question mark or sickle asterism you also notice Arcturus, a very bright star from the constellation Bootes, rising in the east. In the northeast, another bright star, Vega, of the constellation Lyra. And as we get to local midnight, you'll also notice Cygnus returning to the sky in the northeast. And Cygnus brings the Milky Way. So as we approach the early hours of the morning, you'll notice signs of Scorpius starting to rise in the southeast. And then, of course, we see the Milky Way core returning to the night sky. So I'm sure everyone's excited about the Milky Way core returning to the night sky. It's also a really good time for a Milky Way arch panorama facing east so it is officially the beginning of milky way core season you also notice rising in the southeast there venus and mars the only real planet action this month and they rise in the southeast in the pre-dawn hours and as we approach the end of the month they will be joined with saturn as well on the 28th there will also be a moon underneath the three planets and then on the 29th is when venus and saturn will be in conjunction and they'll be about two degrees apart on to the southern hemisphere you'll notice the likes of carina and the crux starting relatively high in the southeast but climbing higher as the night goes on and these small and large magellanic clouds now sinking down to the southern horizon as we approach midnight 
they are joined by Canopus, the second brightest star in the night sky. But this region of the Milky Way here with the Corona Nebula, really beautiful region and it's nice and high now, so a good target for star trackers. Facing northwest, the bright summer constellations in the southern hemisphere, the likes of Orion, Taurus, Gemini, they all start the, the night very high in the northern skies, but sink down to the western horizon and begin to set around local midnight. You also notice Cancer and Leo with the not only backwards but upside down question mark asterism very high in the north in the late evenings as well. In the east around 10 pm you'll notice Arcturus, very bright star in the constellation Bootes rising. You'll see Scorpius already rising before local midnight. Those in the southern hemisphere get a much better view of this region of the night sky and you'll see already by 1am the Milky Way core is above the horizon and it climbs higher and higher into the sky so much better vantage point for the Milky Way and there again as you see rising in the southeast we have Venus and Mars and Venus very bright at minus 4.6 Mars a little bit more moderate and as the month goes by, Saturn will come up to join those two. So we have a nice trio of planets. And then on the 28th, there will be... Oh, there it is. <laughs> the Moon as well. So you have a Moon, Mars, Venus and Saturn very close together in the sky, rising in the east. Coming back to the middle of the month, facing east just before sunrise, you may get a glimpse of Mercury and Jupiter. The ecliptic is very steep against the horizon in the morning in the southern hemisphere, so you have a much better chance of spotting Mercury and Jupiter. But as the month goes by, Mercury sinks back down to the sun and is lost in the morning twilight, but you will be able to see Jupiter rising in the east in the pre-dawn hours at the end of the month. The star tracker target this month is an open cluster in the constellation Cancer Messier 44. It's also known as the Beehive Cluster. It will show up even in your wide angle photos, but it looks great through a telescope, binoculars or a telephoto lens. It's not exactly a faint target, so it doesn't require a lot of integration time. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, it can be found reaching culmination in the South in the late evening skies. And from the Southern Hemisphere, it reaches culmination in the North in the evening skies as well. I'll add a link in the video description below to the website Telescopius, which gives further information and allows you to preview how big it will appear in your lens or telescope. Full moon this month is on the 18th, and it's known as the worm moon for the earthworms that appear in the ground at this time of year. A sign of spring, which is albeit not quite as pretty as flowers or lambs in the field. On to the special events this month. So this year the equinox falls on the 20th of March. At this time, Earth's axis is neither tilted towards nor away from the sun. And all over the planet, we experience a roughly similar length of day and night time. The actual day where you have equal day and equal night is called the equilux. And depending on your latitude, it will fall within several days of the actual equinox. The equinox marks the start of astronomical spring in the northern hemisphere, where the days get longer and the nights get shorter. But for those of you in the southern hemisphere, it is the fall equinox and the nights will be getting longer for you guys down there. Now, something I touched on in last month's video is the zodiacal light. So this is a triangular diffuse glow that you see emanating from the horizon in the direction of the sun, either during the morning twilight or the evening twilight. It's caused by interplanetary dust, so dust that's within the same plane as all of the planets. And it used to be thought that this dust came from comets and asteroids over the eons, um, but recent research, um, particularly from measurements taken by NASA's spacecraft Juno, suggests that this dust is actually coming from dust storms on Mars. 
So it might be that Mars is responsible for all of this dust within the plane of the planets. But I'll put some links down in the video description below for further reading on that. Now, because the dust is in the same plane as the planets, you always see the zodiacal light straddling the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is an imaginary line which the sun, the moon, and the planets all follow in the night sky because they're all sort of orbiting in the same plane. We see them all following the same path along the night sky. And the best time to see the zodiacal light is when the ecliptic is angled steep to the horizon. And so at this time of year, in the northern hemisphere, in the evening skies after sunset, the ecliptic is angled nice and steep to the horizon. So that means that the zodiacal light extends higher into the sky and it's easier to observe and easier to photograph. If the ecliptic was angled quite low to the horizon, it wouldn't extend very high in the sky and it would be very difficult to see through Earth's atmosphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's actually better in the morning skies at this time of year. So the ecliptic will be nice and steep against the horizon in the morning skies. But that said, most people in the southern hemisphere live relatively close to the equator where the ecliptic is always pretty steep against the horizon. So you could probably see the zodiacal light all year round morning and evening. But for those of us at mid to high latitudes in the northern hemisphere, the evening skies at this time of year is a really good opportunity. Now, if you live in a pristine a dark sky area, like a oil class one or a two, the zodiacal light will actually be seen all the way along the ecliptic, so arching across the entire night sky. That triangular diffuse glow in the direction of the sun is a lot brighter because the light of the sun is being forward scattered towards you. There's another bright region of the zodiacal light at the antisolar point, and the antisolar point is the point of the sky that's directly opposite the sun. And the reason that point in the night sky is a little bit brighter is because the light of the sun is being backscattered and sort of reflected back towards you. And so if you look in the direction directly opposite the sun, you might be able to see and photograph a very faint but slightly brighter blob of zodiacal light called the Gegenschein. It's quite difficult to observe. You really need to let your eyes dark adapt. You need pristine dark skies with clear atmospheric conditions. Um, but if you're using a camera, perhaps try using a star tracker to extend your shutter speed and get better detail. This image was captured by Thomas Slavinsky. It's also going to be featured in my book, which is soon to be published, Photographing the Night Sky. Sign up to my mailing list if you want to hear any news about that, because we're getting very, very close now. But if you want to try and photograph the gig and shine this month, make sure you head to a really dark location. Make sure the weather and the atmospheric conditions are nice and clear. And then the best time to photograph it would be around local midnight. And it starts the month in the constellation Leo. Um, but as the month goes by, it heads into the constellation Virgo. So local midnight, aim in that direction. Use the star tracker if you can. Try and get rid of the noise in your image because that will really help you to bring out the gig and shine. So a good challenge for you this month. And that's all I've got for you this month, guys. Now on to the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and upload their images to social media using the hashtag Wittens. I then pick my favourite three to win a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky t-shirt. And first place wins a Photo View Photography Guidebook of their choice. Last month's theme was the moon, and we had lots of amazing images. I think it was a very conceited effort to enter beautiful moon images this month. But in third place was this image from T. Spire's Images After Dark. Beautiful image of the moon setting, or maybe rising, over the sea. Gorgeous red colour, because it's very close to the horizon. And I love how that red colour is being painted onto the clouds as well. And that foreground building just gives a very War of the Worlds feel about this image, which is nice and dark and dramatic and moody. So really love this image. 
In the second place was this image from Murray Richard of the moon and the Vandalian Tower sort of silhouetted inside the moon. And the more you look at this image, the more you realise there's there's more going on. Um, So on the right-hand side there, you've got that little sheep sort of wandering into the scene. And the top left corner has a flock of birds flying through the scene. And it's just nice to just wander around the image and see all of the different elements. And then in first place was this image from Colmpool in Estonia. And I absolutely loved this image. The shadow of the, the tree on that pristine snow. It's just absolutely stunning. I love the lone figure. Adding a bit of scale and human element to the scene as well. The burst on the moon looks great. I love the little clouds as well. They're almost like leaves on the trees. And just the whole blue, calm, serene sort of colour theme to this image. Just really, really, really loved it. So well done to all, and I will get your prizes to you as soon as possible. This month, I am, of course, going to go for the zodiacal light. It's a subject which quite often doesn't receive many entries, so let's see how you guys do this month. Anyway, thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already, and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.